very good afternoon students. Yes, very good afternoon students. Uh, yesterday we learned uh, some of the population interactions where I mentioned about uh, the two interactions. We studied about mutualism, we studied about uh, the commensalism and the proto cooperation. And also I have mentioned about the negative interaction that is amensalism, where we studied about the allelopathy and we also studied about the antibiosis. Well, in this lecture, we are going to study about the negative interaction. The first and the foremost is the predation. So, if you see what is the predation here, the interaction between two organisms in which one organism is getting benefited and the other organism it gets harmed or ill. So, you can say positive and now, the predation, when we speak about predation, the first thing that strikes to our mind or comes to really our mind is about the tiger and deer. Now, this interaction where uh, the tiger and deer, it turns about the predation. The tiger is the predator, whereas the deer is the prey. Now, this predation is very important. Now, this predation is very important. Because this creation uh, is one way of uh, moving the energy, or you can say transfer of energy from one trophic level to the other trophic level. For instance, you know the plants are eaten by herbivores, and these herbivores they are consumed by carnivores. So they act as a passage for transfer of energy from one trophic level to the other trophic level. So you can say that they are energy conduits. Energy conduits. Energy conduits. And if you see the importance of this predation in ecology, they maintain balance. Remember that they help to maintain maintain ecological balance. Ecological balance. Now, what is this ecological balance? See, the deers are there in the forest, the deer, if their number exceeds and there is no tiger, if in the habitat, if there is no tiger and only in the presence of prey, such as the deers, the number of the deers will increase. The numbers of deer will increase. Now, when they increase in population, what will happen? The entire grass will get consumed, which will imbalance the ecosystem. The presence of the predator ensures that the ecosystem is functioning normally. So we can say that maintain the ecological balance. So predators maintain ecological balance. Now, if you see one more, if they help in maintaining maintain ecological diversity. Ecological diversity. What is this ecological diversity? So if you see. The one of the best example, the disaster. Disaster, starfish, starfish experiment. Where we saw that the starfish disaster, which is generally found in the American Pacific coast, American Pacific coast. These fish, starfish, when, when it was taken out from the uh, region, from the intertidal region, they saw that more than 10 invertebrates, more than 10 invertebrates got extincted. You understand? Experiment in an enclosed ex experimental setup. When this disaster starfish was taken out from that study area, there were more than 10 invertebrate species got excluded or they were removed. Meaning what? Because of the interspecific competition between the various organisms, 10 invertebrates, they got this. Means what? The disaster fish it acts as a keystone species. It helps to maintain the diversity of various population of different species. So this is very important. 
they help to maintain the ecological diversity. One more important thing if, uh, if uh, you want to know is they act as a biocontrol methods. Means they can be useful as a biocontrol methods. Huh? Predation is one of the important biocontrol methods which we have already learned in uh, our previous, uh, you can say, lectures. The, uh, you can say, microbes in human welfare. Uh, we have seen so many of the organisms which control the, uh, you can say, uh, various uh, organisms. For instance, if I tell you the uh, best example that suits biocontrol is one of the, uh, you can say, the prickly pear. This prickly pear cactus was introduced in Australia. It was introduced in Australia. Now, in the year 1920, 1920, in the year 1920, the prickly pear cactus was introduced in Australia in the grassland. Now, over a period of time, say in some years, the number of population of this, the number of prickly pear cactus, the population of this increased dramatically. It increased dramatically because it does not have the predator. This is an exotic species that has been introduced in Australia and in, uh, you can say short period this prickly pear cactus grew dramatically meaning the number it uh, increased its number to its maximum capacity because there was no predator. Now to control this prickly pear huh, a South American moth moth from South America, the name of the moth is Cactoblastus. Cactoblastus. Cactoblastus cactorum. Cactorum. It is a moth which is a predator for the particular cactus, was introduced in Australia to control that particular cactus. Now, when this moth was introduced, the number of this particular cactus was reduced or it was brought under control. Now this is how the nature has some of the biocontrol agents no? where one organism is controlled by the other organism. If the number of this particular cactus increased and it created so much of you can say the concern to the Australia because wherever the grassland was spread this particular cactus was found there because it has a high reproducing capacity. Now, to control this, they introduce the Cactoblastus cactorum. Similarly, we have uh, in India the problem of uh, the water hyacinth, the Ipopia species, where we have saw, uh, saw that it causes terror of Bengal, the scourge of water bodies, what we say. Now, for that also, we don't have biocontrol. Now, we, people are still finding out the ways and the means to control that uh, water hyacinth and you know, the spread of. Now, whatever water bodies you take, it is one of the most, uh, you can say, weed that grows readily uh, in the available uh, conditions. So, to control that, you should have an uh, organism, predator. So, the importance of predator is very important. So, remember these important points, the energy uh, predators act as energy conduits and maintain ecological balance, they maintain the ecological diversity and they act as a biocontrol uh, agents. Remember these predators. Now, most of uh, you can say insects, they are uh, you can say uh, predators for the plants. Plant act as a prey. Now, more than twenty-five percent, twenty-five percent of insects, insects are phytophagous. They are phytophagous. Remember this. They are phytophagous. Now, to get eaten or being uh, you can say to get uh, avoided by being eaten is one of the important adaptation shown by the prey. Prey they have to survive against the uh, predators. Now what adaptations these prey show against the predators? There are some adaptations seen with respect to animals and plants. Let us see what are those adaptations. So, if you see some of the adaptations, uh, 
adaptations of prey against predators. Now, what are the adaptations shown by the animals? If you see animals, animals they have some adaptations such as the mimicry, then camouflage, camouflage. So mimicry and camouflage. Mimicry and camouflage are some of the adaptations shown by the prey. Now, what is mimicry? They imitate or they try to make a similar behavior of the thing with the other organism so that it cannot be caught by the predator. Now, what is camouflage? Cryptic coloration shown by one organism of different organism. That we say that's camouflage. Now, as chameleon we see, it requires the color of a plant or a stem or a branch where it is moving, or you can say the mantis that are dried leaves from the grasshopper. So it takes the color of the leaf, so it cannot be easily identified. So these are some of the camouflage. Now even if you see some of the organisms, the best example, the monarch butterfly. Monarch butterfly fly. It is the butterfly which has some chemical substance in it. Its predator is bird. Now, bird is unable to feed on monarch butterfly because this monarch butterfly has certain chemical substances which give distasteful. Meaning what? Huh? Even now, the birds they feel uh, wanting of, uh, when they try to uh, go near the monarch butterfly because during the caterpillar stage, this monarch butterfly has, uh, uh, you can say, it has consumed some uh, uh, chemical substance from the weed. So that when it goes to the adult stage, monarch butterfly has so much of uh, chemicals in it that even the uh, birds, they don't consume it because of the distasteful remembrance. Okay, so this is one uh, uh, few adaptations, mimicry, camouflage, and one uh, secreting chemical substances so that it cannot be get predated. So these are the adaptations. Now, what are the adaptations shown by the plants? Now, if you see the plants, plants are, you can say, they cannot move. They are unable to locomote. They don't show locomotion. They are fixed to an area. Now, plants, they show adaptations such as the presence of thorns or spines. Example is acacia and cactus. Now in these plants you will see that to avoid themselves being eaten uh, like you can say the grazers and browsers to protect themselves from grazers and browsers they you can say they have some modifications such as thorns and spines which help them to get protected from the predators. Now again the plants uh, they secrete certain toxic chemicals the best example is Caronopis Calotropis, you know, they contain the cardiac, cardiac glycosides, which are found to be very harmful to the uh, animals, which consume them, herbios, which can consume them. So that's why uh, some uh, herbios, they don't consume this plant, uh, calotropis. So calotropis gets protected from its predator by sitting certain uh, uh, Compounds such as cardiac glycosides. Okay, one more uh, example if you want. You know all of the compounds such as nicotine, then caffeine, then uh, quinine, or even you can take uh, many other secondary metabolites which are there. They are secreted to get protected from the predators. These compounds, the plant, they secrete. To get protected from the predators. So we humans, what we have done, we have uh, used these chemicals for various uh, uh, purposes. But the plants basically produce, synthesize these compounds as secondary metabolites to get protected from these 
uh, organism. So you can say the herbivores. Okay, so we need to remember this. Since plants they are immobile, meaning they cannot move from one place to other, they generally undergo these kind of modifications. They show thorn spines, which are generally found in notice in the acacia and cactus, calorotis, which secretes the cardiac glycosides, which are found to be detrimental to the predators. Then you have a nicotine, canthin, quinine, all these compounds are secreted to get protected from the predators. So you need to remember these examples. So this is all about the predation. So always remember predation functions are very important because you know they are the energy produced meaning they transfer, they act as a passage, predators act as a passage for the transfer of energy from one trophic level to the other trophic level and they maintain the ecological balance, they maintain the ecological diversity and they are best, you can say they can be used as predators are best biocontrol agents, remember this. Now going further, the next thing we have to discuss here is parasitism. The here is parasitism. Now what is parasitism? As you have seen, most of the diseases such as malaria, okay, uh, even the brown one, mascaris, what we say. So these diseases, you know, they take the nourishment from the host. So always in parasitism, we talk about the parasite and Parasite and a host, remember that. So, the kind of interaction seen here is also plus sign negative. So, parasitism. Parasitism. Remember this. Okay. So, parasitism, the kind of interaction seen here is one organism is getting naked, whereas the other one is getting killed or being, uh, you can say, harmed. So, parasitism here, one is, you can say, parasite. It is a parasite, the other is you can say um, uh, host. So always in parasitism, we should talk, we should talk about the parasite and host. So parasite is the one which is going to be benefited, and the host is one which is going to be harmed. Now, parasite does not kill the host. Remember this: the parasite never kills the host, but it will make the host weak. It will make the host weak so that it can easily be related so that it can easily be predated, meaning what it will be to a predator, rather it will not directly die from the parasitism, remember this. Now, as you see the categories of parasites, there are two types, ectoparasites, ectoparasites and endoparasites, and endoparasites. Remember this. What are these ectoparasites and endoparasites? If you see ectoparasites, here the parasite will always be present on the outermost layer of the organism, meaning what outer surface of the organism. Here the parasite will not invade into the organism, it will be present outer surface, means it is found outside the body of the organism, on the surface you can say. So examples here, the lice on humans, the lice on humans, then the pigs on dog, Picks on dog. Then you can consider the example of the copepods, copepods on marine fishes, marine fishes. Then the example of cascuta, cascuta uh, on the hedge plants, hedge plants. So these are some of the examples that represent the ectoparasitism means they are found outside the body. So lichen, uh, lice on humans, pigs on dog, copepods on marine fishes, cascota on the hedge plants. These are some of the examples you should be uh, remember. Next, what are endoparasites? Endoparasites are those parasites which are generally found within the body of an organism. They remain attached or you can say includes possibility to the internal structure of the body, meaning what they are found inside the body of the body. Okay, so a host may be one or it may be two. So endoparasites are those parasites which are found inside the body. Okay, what are the examples here? The best example you can quote is the uh, you can say tapeworm, ascaris. Ascaris or round worm, you 
can consider the example of glass morning liver view so these are some of the examples of the endoparasite here the host may be single or they may be double remember this paper as you know paper they are uh, found uh, inside the uh, humans as well as in the uh, you can say big uh, whereas ascaris round one they are found in the uh, humans as well as in fishes uh, plasmodium you know the host is uh, aphis mosquito as well as the humans liver field again uh, host and the uh, other organisms so these are the four examples which represent the endoparasitism now what you see endoparasites they have unique adaptation uh, these endoparasites they show unique adaptations now what are the adaptations shown by these uh, endoparasites adaptations now if you see adaptations the first adaptation is that they have you can say they lack the unnecessary sense organs they lack the unnecessary sense organs Unnecessary sense organs. So they lack the unnecessary sense organs. They lack the digestive system. They lack digestive system. Then they show high reproducing capacity. They show high reproducing capacity. Then they have a thick cuticle. They have a thick cuticle. They have a thick cuticle, and they definitely they will be having, or you can say, the presence of adhesive organs. Presence of adhesive organs, such as such as suckers. And hook or well, hosteria, such uh, organs are present. So, you must be knowing that the endoparasites they show few adaptations, such as the presence of thick cuticle, the presence of unnecessary sense organs, they lack the digestive system, they have high reproducing capacity, and the presence of adhesive organs, such as the suckers and hooks, well, so that they can firmly uh, fixed to the host. So these uh, adaptations help them to survive inside the host. Huh? I didn't remember this. Okay. And if you see the cascuta, uh, the cascuta, one of the interesting plant, where you will see that it does not bear the leaf. They do, do not bear the leaf. The reason is that the food and the water requirements is met by uh, showing the connection with respect to the xylem and flowing of the host plant. The host plant provides all the nourishment required by the plant. That's why you will see that the dry, uh, you can say, uh, dry stem only. There will be no leaves, absence of leaves, not completely uh, in the cascuta. Cascuta is generally found in the uh, plants which grow on the hedges. Remember this. Okay, so this is about the parasitism. <laughs> The next thing we have to study is the competition. So, what is this competition? Competition. Here, both the organisms they are affected. Both the organisms they are affected. Now, when we say competition, when two related species when they share or compete for uh, resources, so one of them gets eliminated and the other one they will dominate. Okay, one will be dominating and the other one will, it will be removed or it will be extended or it will be excluded. So, this we say competition. competition. Generally, competition uh, like it will. Uh, you can say it will uh, affect both the organisms. But if you see the proper definition of uh, this uh, uh, competition, 
or it can be best defined as a process, as a process, as a process in which a species fitness is measured measured in terms of R value. R value. You know what is R value? It is intrinsic intrinsic rate of natural increase. Intrinsic rate of natural increase. Now it is a process in which a species fitness, a species fitness is significantly reduced, is significantly reduced in the presence, in the presence, in the presence of another species. Okay, so this will be the proper definition for the computation. You know, this computation is critically important because, uh, as per the Darwin, uh, as per his uh, you can say observation, he said that computation is the one, interspecific computation is the one which should uh, help in the, you can say, uh, origin, no? evolution, no? which, which have helped in the uh, uh, evolution. Okay, so. He stated that the interspecies population is the one which is deciding or you can say signal factor in the uh, evolution. Okay. And uh, if you see the computation, uh, the computation may be intraspecific, it can be intraspecific or it can be interspecific. Interspecific. So what is this intraspecific? When the computation occurs between Closely, closely related, related species we call it as the intraspecific. Now, what is intraspecific? If a combination is observed between two, between two unrelated species, unrelated species we call it as the uh, we can say interspecific. No, interspecific, intra and inter. We should remember. So when the computation occurs between the two closely, between two closely related species, we call it as intraspecific computation. And if the computation occurs between the two closely related unrelated species, we call it as what? The interspecific computation. Now, having studied these two computations, let us study with the help of example. Now the best example you can put is the South American shallow water. South American shallow lake. There we will notice the interspecific uh, combination one between the resident fish of uh, zooplankton and it is given by flamingos, uh, which are visitors. Remember this. Now, there is a lake in the South America which has shallow water. There you will find the abundance of zooplankton with the two species, different species. The fish, one is which is the resident of that lake, and the other one which is a visitor to that lake, that is flamingos. They both compete for the common resource that is zooplankton. Remember this. Okay, one more example if you see the presence of, you can say, interference computation of the equal. Like uh, when there is a, you can say, deers are there, you can put deers in a forest, and there is a presence of a tiger or a lion, and when uh, the same uh, uh, deers, uh, they are also prey for uh, predators such as hyena, wolf, or fox, when they enter, and uh, this tiger also enters in that situation, uh, these uh, two, tiger and the hyenas, they may uh, get into fight. But as soon as uh, deers see them, they may uh, run away. So the tiger also did not get the prey, whereas the wolf also did not get the prey. Such we call it as interference computation. Remember that. Okay. And 
uh, if you see the one more example where uh, I mentioned about the uh, computation, always remember the computation uh, is not uh, like uh, closely related. It can be among the unrelated species also. So now, computation uh, can be, you can say, it leads to the uh, what you can say, extinction as observed by Boss. Now, Boss, he did an experiment wherein he observed that uh, because of the computation, uh, there was an extinction of one particular species. Uh, what he said, meaning what two closely related species cannot share a common resource, the superior one will exclude or remove the inferior one. That's what he observed. And he stated one principle which we know it by the name of Gauss Competitive Exclusion Principle. Okay. And uh, here you should remember one example Gauss Gauss Competitive Computative Exclusion Principle. Huh? Gauss Cognitive Exclusion Principle. It says that two closely related species competing for similar resources cannot coexist. Cannot coexist. Superior species will exclude the inferior species. This is what the Gauss Competitive Exclusion Principle. So, according to it, two closely related species cannot means you can say two closely related species competing for a similar resource cannot you can say cannot coexist remember this two closely related species competing for similar resources competing for similar resources Cannot coexist. Cannot coexist. So this principle, it was based on one of his experiment. Uh, the name of the experiment, uh, the experiment what he did was with uh, paramecium. Paramecium. Paramecium polyria and paramecium. Okay, so these are the two species which he uh, cultured in different plus giving different nutrition. So over a period of time, he observed that the paramecium oridia as well as paramecium paratium both grew to their maximum uh, uh, limit. But uh, when he cultured a mixture of these organisms in a single flask, he noticed that. P aurelia outnumbered the P quadrilateral. This is because the P aurelia, that is paramecium aurelia, was more efficient in utilizing the resources than the paramecium quadrilateral. So paramecium aurelia is a superior species, whereas the paramecium quadrilateral is the inferior species. Now, this particular paramecium aurelia it outnumbered or it excluded or it removed the paramecium quadrilateral. So the computation always superior species go to survive of the fitness what we talk about here because of the better efficiency of utilization of nutrients this particular species outnumber the paramecium quadrilateral so this is what the boss experimented and he came to the conclusion that uh, no two species uh, living or sharing the same resources uh, cannot coexist and the superior species will exclude the inferior species that's what it is uh, uh, observation was put into statement, but this cannot be true for all situations. There is some exclusions, uh, which we say resource partition. So, what is this resource partition? So, if you see. See the organism, or you can say the species, the closely related species living in a uh, common habitat and sharing or competing for a similar resource. Uh, 
uh, it's not mandated that one has to eliminate the other. No, there are some, uh, you can say, uh, examples or there are some situations where they both coexist in harmony and uh, they don't affect each other. Such competition is also seen and we call it as resource partition. And the experiment proved that Mark Atto, Mark Atto, where we work with wanderers. So these are her chambers. These are her chambers. Living in a single tree. Living in a single tree. Huh? So five warblers. You know, five species of warblers, closely related species. They lived in a single tree where they did not compete for the resources. They could not compete for the space. Now what they saw is they all the five species they had different they had different origin they have they had a different origin pattern uh, you can say foraging uh, and feeding feeding pattern remember this so Martha, who, no, his experiment demonstrated that five warblers or chambers staying or residing in a single tree. He noticed that these closely related species never competed, never tried to eliminate other species, but they chose different feeding time and a different foraging pattern so that they can live, they can coexist. So, this is the one we call it as resource partition. Okay, and uh, one more experiment where uh, they saw that the superiority, the more superiority, uh, the Galapagos Island, in the Galapagos, in the Galapagos Island, the Abingdon, Abingdon tortoise was, you can say, eliminated because of the introduction of introduction of goat no? introduction of goat no? abindan is a tortoise no? because of the introduction of goat the abindan tortoise was nearly close to the extinction near to extinction because the goat is a better grazer it is a better browser and grazing. So the grass, goat can better eat the grass, no? whereas the tortoise, which is slow grazing. Now this is a fast browser. So introduction of goat nearly in 10 years, 10 years, the abundant tortoise were about to extend. So this was, the, you can say, the effect of introducing the goat, which was a better, you can say, browser. Similarly, one more experiment done by Honnell, one of the elegant study done by Honnell in, uh, you can say, the rocky sea coast, intertidal sea coast of Scotland. Well, he worked with the barnacles, which are the arthropods. Remember, these barnacles he chose two. The one was the superior barnacle, we call it as Dalanus. The inferior barnacle, we call it as Catamelus. Now, we, in an experiment study, he showed that the bananas, which is a uh, superior or you can say larger in size, it could outnumber or it could eliminate this uh, catamaran. So this was seen and uh, this was the one uh, you can say very good by Parnell, huh? Parnell's experiment we see. So that concludes your chapter, the organisms and population. Uh, thank you, have a good day.